one of the reasons we are really focusing on this learning lab um, is the whole issue of trying to link foodborne issues and food safety issues to public health nutrition. And the, the direct link between foodborne issues and, and nutrition is through agriculture, really. And this is an area that is emerging, and it's really important because of the fact that the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, really focus on food-based approaches as a way to target nutrition. So we can't really walk away from the fact that there are significant food safety issues, not just at the household level, but at the community level and regional and national level. And often the food, uh, food safety issues transcend um, countries because there's so much food trade that's happening across different countries uh, in Africa, in Asia, between Africa and Europe and so on. And there's, there's lots of implications at that level, but also at the individual level that we need to really understand better if we want to implement nutrition interventions that are sensitive towards nutrition. Um, so really we are going to be focusing on um, this idea of how do we study food safety and issues around food safety um, relative to nutrition outcomes. And just to give you an idea of the agenda, we, what we tried to do was set up a series of presentations. Um, and we're going to start with Patrick Webb, who's going to focus on looking at the sort of food safety issues from a policy perspective and, and trade perspective, and then move on to Ahmed Kablan, who is going to talk about it from a value chain, what are, where are the potential intervention points. Um, and then um, I'm going to speak about some really specific issues that we are dealing with in some of our studies, um, and this is where some of the biological stuff is going to come in, uh, on environmental entropathy and stunting as well as the microbiome, and how we are integrating some of these issues in our applied research. What I'm hoping is, you know, in this session, we are going to be really putting our thinking hats on to bring together the areas of agriculture, nutrition, and health uh, on these topics. Um, Joanna is going to finish the set of presentations by talking specifically of some of her work, which is focused on mycotoxins. She's going to talk about what it means um, to have mycotoxins in the food supply, where are they coming from, what are the kind of markers you would use, um, and then also talk a little bit about study design, like how do you even assess and how do you incorporate these different markers into um, applied research studies. What we're hoping for is that we each will spend 15 minutes, no more, on our presentations. Um, and then we'll try to do a Q&A of like just a few burning questions if you need some clarification on what the speaker has said. So what we decided to do was to really give an assignment. We have you guys, and probably will be about three groups maybe, or four groups, um, and, and think about a specific research question or a top priority question that comes to your group's mind, and how would you design it and implement it? So it's a little bit, little bit of a, um, uh, it, it's a little bit of a freelance exercise. We don't have a guided process, but the idea is that all of you are researchers in this room, and we're hoping you're going to bring some really great ideas to the table. I'm just going to then hand off to Patrick Webb, um, who can come and speak about um, his topic which is uh, food safety for nutrition. Food safety is a poster child of interdisciplinary uh, concerns and interdisciplinary work, and therefore a real challenge in terms of research, how, how to best understand the scale, the, the risks, the threats posed by a variety or accumulation of food-related, food-borne diseases to health, nutrition, uh, and, and so on. And what do we do about it? How do, how do we define the impact of interventions? How do we understand cost effectiveness of one action versus another? Right? There's a whole domain uh, of questions here. And since this whole uh, week is really about both cross-disciplinarity and how to choose the right tools to answer real life questions that cut across the borders between agriculture, nutrition, and health, Food safety is one of those that's really um, at the forefront of everyone's um, concerns. Now, I, I know nothing about food safety other than about, I don't know, a few years ago, five years ago maybe, I was in Haiti in remote areas of the mountain uh, region in the center, uh, you know, very remote. Uh, and of course, you see small markets, uh, traditional open, wet markets uh, everywhere. And I was doing interviews of uh, households, particularly uh, per people coming to purchase at these markets, about what are their current burning uh, concerns in terms of food security. Right? It was a, 
a fairly straightforward food security uh, assessment. And what I was expecting was what the usual. You know, uh, we don't have enough income or purchasing power. The prices are variable. There's volatility in prices, or you know, there's there's not enough diver diversity. Certain seasons of the year, we can't find fruits and veg, even though people. You know, those are the kinds of things I was expecting. But what came out as number one, really across the board, was we fear that some of the foods on the market are killing us. It's like, come again? Food safety was the number one concern. And it really, in this, in this particular case, it related mainly to processed foods that were well past their sell-by date, that were being dumped in Haiti from Latin American countries. Right? And most of the consumers were illiterate, and even if they were, they couldn't speak Spanish. Uh, and when they bought things like these weird and wonderful colored sausages, sausage meats, their children were falling sick and sometimes very sick. And there was a real concern that among mothers that what was available on the market was poisonous and that somebody was actually intentionally poisoning them, right? There's a lot of, a lot of things, cultural, political, uh, perceptions versus facts that go around the whole food safety question. But this, this brought home to me that food safety, the perception of food safety, has become a real pillar, a real core of the food security agenda, right? We're, we're all familiar with supply and availability and access and accessibility and utilization and uh, continuous supply, but the safety of the food that is available has become a real concern to the consumer and is increasingly something that cuts right the way along the value chain. So processors, marketers, as well as producers are all implicated in the story of food security, which is why, of food safety, sorry, which is why it becomes such an important concern. That means there's, there's opportunities here that food safety is a big new research and policy focus uh, for food and nutrition uh, security. It's something we need to embrace. It's something we need to know more about. And it's something we can do things about, right? Making the supply of food safe is an, an almost a no-brainer. That is something that the public sector as well as the private sector has responsibility for. It is a challenge because this comes at a time when people are focusing on the quality of diets. We need to enhance high quality diets for everyone, and that's important for overweight and obesity and NCDs as well as for undernutrition. The problem is that many of the most nutrient rich foods are the most perishable and sometimes the most prone to carrying food safety hazards, whether they be types of fruits and veg, whether they be meats and milks, whether they be uh, peppers, but essentially things that are nutrient rich often perish fast if you don't manage it carefully. Right? So that's a bit of a paradox. We want more of the perishables available, so we want people to produce them more and make them more available, but at the same time they carry th risks potentially, and we have to manage those risks. We have to preempt those risks. Policy implications are that there's no one intervention point for the policymaker. The, the actions are going to be needed at the very macro level in terms of regulations and safety standards and imposing those, um, but also in terms of pursuing joint responsibility with all the actors in the value chain. Some of those, as you'll hear, some of the toxins that uh, enter the food supply are on the farm or in the field or in the sea, right? The, so the producer ha has a responsibility, but so do the marketers who are not necessarily using refrigerated trucks. We need at least 500 brand new refrigerated trucks if we're going to ensure food safety standards to deliver groceries in the way that Amazon is about to uh, try and do. And then the research needs, and they're across the board, basically. This is a new, relatively new area that for many, many years has been dom dominated in the health, public health sector and or regulatory uh, domains. What is the scale? What are the types and the scale of the different threats? And Ahmed is going to talk a little bit about that. What is the nature of those threats in terms of the things that matter to us, in terms of 
disease prevalence in terms of immune suppression and then in terms of growth outcomes and nutrition, right? Child growth being an important thing. We know very little about the mechanisms. Some have been proposed and we'll hear more about those. And then what are the solutions, right? There, there's some solutions are on the table, they need to be implemented, but they need to be implemented carefully. You know, some people have suggested, well, just abolish street vendors, right? or get rid of open, wet markets. Well, no, that's not the way. Supermarkets are not necessarily safer. It depends, you know, there's a lot of, dep it depends, right? So blanket solutions are not necessarily on the table and we need to, we need more evidence to be able to tailor solutions. Uh, just very quickly to, to point out that this is highly recognized now. The, the outgoing uh, DG of WHO fairly recently pointed to food safety being a hidden and overlooked problem and a major uh, source of, of, of the problem. And when she, says, she said that the pool of people at greatest risk is expanding, what she means is that, is that pregnant women, infants, and the elderly who are typically most at risk to foodborne diseases, those groups are expanding uh, in terms of overall uh, population. And she also pointed to the fact that a cross-sectoral cross response is necessary. You need actions in a whole different set, a whole set of domains uh, to be able to address this agenda um, carefully. And now, that is not just a luxury for high-income countries. These uh, the global burden of foodborne diseases, so measured in terms of DALIs by uh, WHO. Um, if you look at where that burden resides, I put the circle around the, those little blue bars. Those little blue bars are high-income countries. The vast majority of the burden of, of the threat is low- and middle-income countries. Right, so this isn't about a luxury problem of, of high-income consumers. The burden of disease resides squarely among the people who le can least afford to be having this problem. So therefore, it's a major uh, challenge to be, a development challenge to be um, addressed. This comes from a global panel um, um, policy brief on food safety. But just take one example, right? Di diarrheal disease agents, so it, it causes a, a, um, an attrition of the nutritional status, which contributes to, can contribute to uh, certain vitamin and mineral deficiencies, can contribute to wasting, and all of that can contribute to the millions of deaths, preventable deaths, related directly to diarrheal disease each year, right? So there is a, at least a notional chain there of, of linkages of mechanisms that we need to know more about. And of course, that's just one uh, possible pathway through here. But the understanding of, of what this means uh, globally and particularly in low-income settings is limited partly because of, of data, partly because many different foods and food systems are implicated. And we do have... Um, different uh, studies that have seen the problems of aflatoxins in Nepal, linked very closely to maize consumption and, pe and peppers, and green leafy veg relating to certain uh, pesticides and herbicides in India, um, fish products doused in formaldehyde to, to make them look fresh, uh, for example. You know, there's all kinds of these threats, again, that Ahmed will talk about, but this isn't just one food and isn't just one food system. Uh, we need to understand a lot more locally about what the diets are and what the threats to, th to and through those diets actually are. Trade, very quickly. Um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was axed by the Trump administration pretty much on, on day one, one of the things that it was seeking to do was actually enhance trade across the Pacific Rim in of fresh fruits, vegetables, and nuts. Some of the things, the nutrient-rich foods, that we want to see more in more people's diets. The idea was to enhance the production and access and lower the price of, of these kinds of products. A lot of the trade of these products is currently hampered by what are called sanitary and phytosanitary uh, restrictions, right? So Codex Alimentarius, which governs cross-border trade of all food products sets very stringent standards on 
the, the quality of foods. And given that these kinds of foods are often, as I said, uh, pot have potential carriers of foodborne diseases, they often face barriers to trade, as do peanuts, as do maize, as do many other products that carry um, toxins. And so this is not just a health and nutrition issue, it's very much a trade and therefore income and therefore poverty reduction issue as well. And finding out how to allay these uh, problems isn't uh, just for nutrition, it's for many other things. So, what needs to be done? I mean, number one is strengthen the evidence base. And we'll talk more. I'd love to hear about your experiences, your, th your thoughts on what are the priority problems in different uh, contexts, and what are appropriate actions. Uh, it matters very much. Uh, food trade regulations are increasingly focusing on the implications for nutrition, gradually, not just the implications for income. And that is happening slowly, but it is happening. Uh, we need more of that. We need more uh, discussion at a global level on appropriate regulations. That also matters at the, at the national level. What is appropriate regulation at the national level of standards? Uh, so that you don't price people out of the market, you don't restrict market access to certain key foods for the poor. Um, what are the new technologies that could reduce perishability and improve quality? Uh, refrigeration is around, has been around for a very long time. It's key, actually. Refrigeration is one of the key elements to cleaning up the food supply, but it's not the only element. And with new technologies, what else is out there? And many countries are actually promoting diet diversification, I'll give East Timor as one, one example of that, where they know that their, for example, their diet is full of aflatoxins from groundnuts or maize. They promote dietary diversification, not just to enhance the quality of the food supply, but to try and minimize exposure to the, to the foods. Don't rely on the foods that are carrying lots of toxins, right? That, probably makes some sense in the short run because there's not a whole lot you can do other than tell people to stop eating, which is not a great policy recommendation in most settings. Um, but diet diversification may or may not help in the long run. We need to, we need to understand a lot more about uh, the real uh, generation of exposures. So finally, this is the, this year's winner of the World Food Prize, Akin uh, Adesina, also pointing out that as food systems evolve, change very rapidly, then the challenges through food safety are rising too, and that this is a particularly important challenge to low-income settings, and therefore one that we have to take extremely seriously. It's no longer just something that high-income countries can afford to, to uh, pay attention to. Thank you. Any, any immediate questions? I do nutrition training here in Nepal mm -hmm. with a Nepali NGO. Um, train people from community level workers to just last week, I was in a middle class Nepali school, quite wealthy, more than middle class. And I get um, several points all the time. When we promote uh, more animal products in our training, like to promote liver in children's diets, Always, I'm told, isn't that dangerous for our kids? Because in the chicken farms, they're using so many antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And when, I, uh, when we're promoting fruit and vegetable, I also have to t um, teach on diabetes and, and heart disease sometimes. So really promoting that there. And I get, but aren't those dangerous? Because there's so many chemicals in them. Right. Nobody worries about right. what's in instant noodles or right. all those right. other things. But the healthy foods we're trying to promote, the public have really latched on to those as being dangerous mm. and other foods as not. And then yeah. just uh, one final thing to mention about food safety. There's a supermarket <laughs> chain in Kathmandu that's, I won't say the name, but they're expanding rapidly at oh, the come moment. On. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, two, two of their um, outlets have opened up recently where I live. And on the outside of these supermarkets, they're not huge ones, but nevertheless, they have opened a stretch of food outlets where you can buy your momos and your lassi and your uh, whatever after you've shopped. Uh -huh. And I've seen them put up four of these outlets on the outside of each of their shops. Okay. Not one of those outlets has any access to water at all. So people are serving and eating in those all days. I've watched 
people preparing food and their hands are dirty and they go like that before they... But the, in the customer's eyes, this is a very modern, middle-class food outlet that's surely better than the street vendor. Right. Not at all. Yeah, good yeah, point. No regulation at yeah. all. As you raise this food safety issue, it's very interesting for the developing countries like ours. Uh, Quick question in mind, does the GMO, genetically modified mm. food, has anything to do with the food safety? Because the countries like developing countries like us will, I think, will benefit probably from the GMOs because we have... <laughs> so is there, <laughs> is there anything to do with the um, food safety and GMOs? Is it a bad thing or a good thing uh, to have GMOs in terms of food safety? Um, yeah, you're not the first person I've heard to say we would benefit from... Uh, GMO technology, the main, the main reason being that where, for example, aflatoxins are a major cause of a, a major problem in developing countries, much of it starts on the farm through poor quality seed, which allows uh, insects to get access to it, the molds to get access to it. Better quality seeds, they don't have to be GMOs, but better quality seed access is one of the solutions. Uh, not alone, but it's one of the solutions. And GMO could play a role in that, in offering better quality seeds. Um, but that's just one small part of that value chain. Yeah, I'm not going to say said, more than it's that. It's better to have something than <laughs> nothing. So at least, I mean, to secure the food supply. Yeah, <laughs> if it doesn't have anything to do with the food safety, why not to have it? Like but the point, yeah, exa exa but the point is that it starts there. It starts in the production right. of food. And it we is. have to understand what are the solutions at that level, mm -hmm. then post-harvest mm -hmm. and storage, mm -hmm. and then people sorting out the good stuff and feeding the bad, eating the bad stuff or feeding the bad stuff to the livestock and then selling the milk. And yes. you know, we have to look at the entire chain and mm -hmm. find the appropriate solutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming and <clears throat> thank you, Patrick, for this introduction. And it is, um, it sits the stage very well. And the question that followed are in the, some of the comments, that's part of the overall value chain, or when you are looking at the value chain, you are looking from A to Z, from production in the farm, from the pre-harvest side, all the way to your table. And that's where we want to consider all the point of entry for uh, food safety. Uh, before I go into this different part of the value chain, I want to highlight where agriculture influence in terms of how I can improve nutrition. And if you look at it from the diet quality, the environmental conditions, uh, into the other side of the food safety condition, all of this, they cross cross onto also food safety. They have food safety implications. And according to the new uh, global food security strategy, food safety have been place their nutrition target have been elevated to the objective level, but at the same time, food safety is one of those things that we need to work on it in order to ensure achieving the nutritional target. And our goal globally, when we are thinking about a nutritional target to achieve and reduce the reduction of stunting by 40% or 20%, we need to move from the mono diet or grain heavy diet way to diverse diet. And Moving to that diverse diet also, as Patrick mentioned, come the problem with the nutrient-dense diet, the breachability for it, and the high exposure and higher risk of uh, food safety concerns. So you are, in order to produce more foods, more vegetables, there is a lot of input involved. There is pesticide, and we're talking about the chemical source of uh, food safety concern, or toxins that could potentially come and contaminate our food. And as some of the comment people are stuck in their mind, this could be the unsafe food. There is the meat and the chicken, which are also perishable. They bring with them the microbe and the pathogen and the viruses and the bacteria. And then, of course, the grain side, when you, are cre you have the mycotoxin component or a mycotoxin part that could affect it or co contribute to food safety concern, but also when you move to fruit and vegetables, there is other mycotoxins that could enter into your food that we need to take uh, care of them and handle them. So essentially, when you are thinking about food safety along the value chain, you want to look from the pre-harvest, the harvest stage, the post-harvest, all the way until it gets to your table. And when thinking about it, there is different point of control and there is different opportunities for control. So if you know what you are dealing with, what are the risks, then that is your opportunity to control it. If you don't know what you are dealing with, that is the problem and we don't know how to control it. Thinking from the pre-harvest and the harvest, so at those two stages, and some of these points I'm gonna mention, the cross into also the post-harvest. So 
we need to know the system biology. And so when you are thinking about system biology, you are thinking about proteomics, you are thinking about cell biology, you are thinking about A to Z. Knowing what we deal with, knowing the pathogen, knowing the different uh, heart, uh, hazards associated with your food, that will help you really get into the identification, detection, and also the uh, 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 prevention. Also, we need to know there is some of these microbes are important for the plant, some of these microbes are important for the production side. Not all of these microbes are bad. So we need to identify the bad microbe versus the good microbes. We need to identify the expression for them. We need to understand their genetics where we can also target them to modify them or to prevent the contamination. We need also to have, back to the point of detection, we need to have a good tools and methodology for detection and diagnostics in order to be able to identify the microbe fast, precisely, early on, the area we identify this kind of contamination, whether we're looking at uh, uh, pathogenic, bacterial, or, non, uh, or viral, or we're looking at chemicals, or we're looking at mycotoxins. We need ways to easy, simple detection. Um, whether it's in the soil or in raw material or we're looking at the pre-processed food or processed food, you need to be able to identify it. And whether or not you want to look at high throughput uh, screening method, that is most probably in industrial uh, situation or in a commercial setting, it is better and faster and will get you uh, hundreds of samples screened at one point, but it is not always practical. So you want to th think about, uh, especially when looking low and uh, middle income countries where we want and what are the most practical way for detection. We need also to think about ways to intervene, intervention and control strategies. So thinking about what are the hazards, then we can identify the control. For example, for aflatoxin, there is biocontrol, there is the aflasafe, as an example, that we apply it in the field to uh, prevent the growth and the production of the toxigenic fungus. You need to think about what are some of the things, the basic, simple things that can help the farmer produce a safer food. So good agricultural practices, as an example for those, irrigation, mulching, uh, depending on the crop, what are the basic, what best uh, um, practices that could help reducing the uh, uh, risk on the plant or the stress. Irrigation, for example, because um, high stress in or drought could produce stress in the plant and will encourage the production of uh, aflatoxin from the asparagillus species. However, if the soil is not, there is no drought, will irrigate it or enough rain, this will not encourage the production of aflatoxin from the species. The same thing when you are looking about cleaning slaughterhouse, house, you are looking at wet markets or not wet market. If they all don't have good drainage system cleaning to get rid of all the byproducts and useful, the animal hair, the animal blood, where it is rich environment for the growth and the production of microbes, then you are contaminating the food. And Delia Grace, she did some good work on the wood market where they tried in Vietnam and then Kenya and other places to move into more formal market or slaughterhouses and that's where the problem started. They, that became due to the lack of maintenance and hygiene as a spool for production of microbes. And then, Population system. We want to know about the moving of the population, and we want to talk about population system. You are not talking about bacteria. We're talking about tech bacteria. We're talking about a human. We talk about animal population and plant population, and that is, we want to understand the movement and the dynamics. How this population could, or people movement, or animal food movement, essentially an animal movement. How it could transfer disease from rural to urban to very urban areas, from one side of the country, other side of the country, or one country or another country, as as well. You, that will also. Uh, we want to think about how we can reduce or prevent the shedding of zoonotic diseases understanding the population movement that will help us understand and control it. We want to think about it also to help us about understanding the cultural norms of food processing and food storage and food handling and what is they normally do and what is safe or what is good practice, what are bad practices, how can we educate them, develop behavior change, education mechanism in order to help them move into a safer and better practices for food preparation, as simple as, for example, hand washing or hygiene, practice best hygiene uh, methodology during food preparation production. And then we want to understand the interaction between the food 
uh, epidemiology and the ecology and the host pathogens. So we want to understand this kind of complex relationship. If we don't really understand it, we can't try or be able to solve this, uh, this interaction, this relationship. When we are looking at the post harvest, so we are looking at what we do with the food after we harvest it and harvesting whether you are getting the crops, the maize, the peanuts, or other from the field, or you are milking the animals, collecting the milk, or the, uh, food, the eggs, or you are looking at um, uh, the meat itself. So it is anything after from moving it from the production side into harvesting it and post-harvesting it. So for example, in terms of grains, we want to control their moisture, so drying is very important. Uh, for mycotoxin, for example, if you have a relative humidity less than 65%, that will stop the, the further production of uh, mold growth and molds. So you are not, the, if you, you have the spores, the spore will not do, convert to an adult mold that will produce aflatoxin. Below 35%, for example, think about where there is no best uh, growth that will happen. So if you have hermetic storage, and where you are controlling the moisture content, you are controlling the humidity, you are controlling um, the temperature inside it, the oxygen level, you, are, you can control, sort of stop the, the growth of the mold, prevent the further production of mycotoxins or best or other uh, contaminant. And then you think about the speed and the rate for drying is very important because it slows drying, that will still give the chance for molds to grow and to cause harm, give bacteria the chance also to propagate and produce their toxins. Then we, the second thing we want to consider is storage, and there is the cold storage and there is ambient temperature storage. Cold storage is important for perishables, fruits, vegetables, dairy product, meat, etc. Ambient temperature storage, when you're thinking about um, grains and non-perishable food, there is the hermetic storage where you're controlling the amount of oxygen in the bag, you're controlling the uh, amount of uh, moisture in the bag, or you prevent the entrance of uh, mo uh, the entrance of uh, moisture into the bag, but it will sort of evaporate it to the outside. The sorting as a post harvest, and it has been shown um, uh, hand sorting for peanut or maize can significantly reduce the amount of aflatoxin in the food. Providing that you hand sort it, you discard it, you don't consume it. Uh, in Nepal, we are doing a mycotoxin assessment on the food. Uh, stuff, so the mere source of aflatoxin uh, sources in the food. And when we did an initial survey in the Banki area, what we noticed, farmers, they know moldy peanuts, for example, or maize are bad. They sort them, which is good. But those sorted, which is the highest concentration, they consume them first. So we need to change this. You sort it, you throw it away. You don't feed it to an animal, you don't feed it to your child, you don't eat it first. If it is moldy, it is bad. So there is one step is good, but they don't follow on what's needed to, need to be done as an example. Shipping and transport, again, this is when you are talking about perishable foods, mostly. Shipping, you need to have to appropriate shipping, control temperature, uh, the hygiene component for it, the receiving department or the receiving factories or the, res uh, the restaurant or wherever this food has been received, the employee's hygiene. Um, all of these are factors that we need to control them. We need to know the implication for them. And if we don't have all of these best practices, we are not really achieving the food safety goal. We can have all the food safe until to the last point they need to get contaminated. This is this figure from uh, an article for John Bett. And this just give an example of um, the, life, the time course of aflatoxin production in, in, in peanuts and during the value chain. And if you look early on from in the pre-harvest stage, you will see the conditions. So irrigation, rain, that means low aflatoxin production. If it is drought, it means aflatoxin starts coming up. The aspergillus uh, uh, species, they produce aflatoxin, for example, at low uh, moisture, or in other words, if there is drought, stress in the plant. Then you have, um, in the, -har the post-harvest point, a drying. You have rapid drying then you, are, you stop the production of aflatoxin in the front because the mold or the fungus is still alive in it. If you have a slow, then you have an increase or a raise in that. Then as you go in the storage, you have good storage versus bad storage. 
uh, you have in the, during the processing. So if you do sorting, you're reducing aflatoxin in the food. You do blanching or you do the heat, which is about 185 degrees, that's when you kill all the spores. So there is no more spores. You are stopping the aflatoxin level. For example, it is 10 parts per billion. When it goes to that point, when you heat it to 185, you are stopping you're killing the spores, so there is no more fungal or spores to produce aflatoxin at that point, and so on. And I highly recommend reading that uh, article. It goes through the different kinds of mycotoxin and different kinds of crops and the condition that you can control with it and what could affect it or not. Finally, in the processing food preparation, whether you're talking household, whether you're talking about the commercial, that is one of the most important final steps. Sometimes you get the food all like meat or vegetables, clean and safe, and then that's at the household level when contamination happens. Some of uh, um, the highly paranoid food safety or uh, recommendations that tell you don't take the kitchen, chicken or the meat out of the fridge unless you are putting it on the stove. So in other, word, in other words, the, you have to be very careful keeping the temperature low uh, uh, to prevent the growth of microbes. And sometimes there is the mixing between, like on the cutting boards, for example, if you are chopping the food and you get the chicken, that small amount transient touch between the raw vegetables and the meat could encourage the growth of certain microbes above certain limit that might cause harm for us. Um, do you know, anyone knows the, the story or do you all know the Typhoid Mary story? Typhoid Mary, she was... Uh, uh, maid or a chef in a household that she was carrying typhoid, it was asymptomatic. She caused the, con the spread of typhoid to about 22, causing severe uh, risk, and she died in quarantine in New York because they did not know what is the problem with typhoid Mary. And above the picture, show you some of the problem you have it in even some middle income countries in the processing of the food to the factory, that's tomatoes, they throw it all over the place, on the belt, they collect it, they throw it back in the belt, then whatever they step on it, that is where contamination source could happen and control, uh, could enter to the food chain. I've got a question. Um, various veterinary drugs are used in high scale meat production. Uh, and we also know that there may be a residue, veterinary drugs residue in those meat. So is there any method to exclude those veterinary drugs residue from that um, meat product which we Veterinary drugs or antibiotics, those are excellent tools that we need them in order to control diseases, but also we don't want to under or overuse them. That would cause, and this is the, anti, the multi drug resistance or microbial uh, or antibiotic resistance, that's a problem. Also, the problem of this antibiotic from the veterinary use could enter into the value chain or causing the drug resistance into the soil through when, because there is. So if you look at the drugs, there are some of these drugs, they got excreted and changed in urine. So they are still in their active form. They could be introduced into the soil and then they could at lower dose now, and then that could reduce microbial resistance uh, in the bacteria in the soil. So prevention of diseases. So a sick animal, you should not be consuming it. And in order to ensure that the production of safe animal production, you need to use Antibiotic, if the animal is sick, you should not slaughter the animal if it is sick or consume it unless it is safe. The same thing, the milk produced by that animal or the eggs could be contaminated or carry a higher load of bacteria if you don't treat them. There are important tools we have, but the problem happens in rural farmer, with rural farmers, they, could not, they can't afford to buy the whole antibiotic, they can't afford to give the full dose, the full length of the treatment, and that when the resistant develop or the disease, the bad side effect or the side effect of the veterinary medicine could enter to the food chain or contaminate, uh, cause harm. Um, one point to your point, I forgot to mention it in this slide here, about the GMOs. One of the things like, um, like in maize or in uh, peanut, now they're working on it, but in maize, for example, uh, as Bachelor can be said, the good seeds, Good seed could be, for example, those who prevent the best infestation. And best infestation some, is one of the predisposing factors that will increase the contamination or, of maize with mycotoxin or the fungal itself that will produce aflatoxin. BT maize, for example, is a GMO product that is resistant to a lot of the pests that could infect the maize, and that could ensure a safer food supply or safer maize to our own food supply. So, and 
that is that I mean there is a balance and I know there is a lot of fear but um, last year there is more about 110 Nobel laureate who came out with a statement but after reviewing all the literature there is no evidence on the harm of GMOs or genetically engineered uh, crops on the human health. So basically in the context of a developing country like Nepal, so basically what could be very cost effective interventions that could be done at different levels of you know, the food chain to reduce the aflatoxin concentration, which could be the interventions which could be scaled up and which are cost effective. Teach the farmers and through the extension, the farm extension, how to prepare their field using of appropriate amount of fertilizers, for example, irrigation of possible um, if there is a, pro a problem with drought. Um, there is some work or initial report came, for example, a low nitrogen content in soil is one of the, those stress factors that will encourage uh, the fungus to produce aflatoxin. Uh, appropriate drying, Again, looking through the post-harvest, so you have the pre-harvest and then you have the post-harvest, a drying storage uh, methodology that could improve. So instead of drying slowly, you want to dry fast. Uh, maybe the government or the farmer community could invest in the dryers. And then at the same time, the hermetic storage um, to prevent the, uh, the recontamination in terms of moisture and best and all of this. So it is all of these things could be cost effective, cheap, easy to do for the farmer, but we need some sort of level of investment from the farmer side and from the local government or the government side. And we have some research have ongoing, we have some evidence supporting these technologies and moisture detection, measuring the moisture. So you need the farmers, for example, when they try to store their grain, the way they use look at the moisture level or not, it's good, which is not accurate, not very scientific. They bite on the seed or they shake it. Um, so there are some ways of detection, but we have, we moved to develop or we have technologies that could measure moisture content very accurately. And that will help you to tell you this is the right point where you need to stop the drying and you, need to, you can start at this point to maintain the, the, the content at that level.